Thanks everybody for being here today. My name is Jonathan Sines and I'm the president of Texas Values Action. I'm also a licensed attorney. And uh, if we haven't met before, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Grew up here in Texas, fifth generation. Um, worked before for Liberty Institute. How many of y'all know Kelly Shackford? Name rings a bell. Uh, so for a number of years, I came down to the Capitol, worked on these issues of faith and family uh, under his wing. It's nice to be under Kelly Shackford's wing. You know? uh, but we're so involved in the work, and we started to see a need to really impact the state at a very focused level. And so Liberty Institute litigates religious liberty cases and primarily, and so as they saw more attacks on religious freedom across the country, they began to get concerned and, and work on cases outside of the state. And so we began to get concerned here at our Austin office about the impact and the issues that we were seeing at the local level. And what do you know? Um, what, look at what's happened in the past year and a half. So Texas Values started about two years ago, and then about a year ago, we started an organization called Texas Values Action, so we could be more aggressive and more impactful uh, on issues affecting people on faith, family, and freedom, and right here at the Capitol, and in the local communities. And so it's very interesting because I grew up in Houston and traveled the state and, and uh, have worked with dear friends, but we started to see these things happening at the local level. Um, and, and so many of us that have worked at the Capitol understand the influence and the impact that you can have when you get involved. And so a lot of people are involved in statewide election issues and state policy issues. Uh, a lot of great leaders that are here today. Uh, but we started to notice signs of things happening at the local level that were very concerned, but with really not much of an ability to engage. Because as you heard Dave mention, when you try to engage in these efforts in all these cities across the state and some of our larger cities, um, you know, that can take a lot of work. You know, if you uh, take a look at my car outside and, and the condition of my tires and so on, um, it'll bring that to light. You try to travel the state and cover all these issues, it will wear on you. And that's what the other side's trying to do. They're trying to split us up. But what we recognize is that what happens at the local level is incredibly important. And, it, and for some of the folks, it's a way for them to undermine what the values of our state are. And that's why we call our organization Texas Values, because we believe, as you do, that those values are faith, family, and freedom. And they always have been. We heard Governor Abbott talk earlier about a historic day today. Travis and the Alamo. They were fighting for faith, family, and freedom that day. They were inside of a religious building is they were fighting for freedom in the future, if you will, of the state of Texas. So these are values that our state has always cared about and always been defined by. But for a number of years, people have tried to reclaim that and say that uh, the values of Texas mean something different. And so I have been litigating cases and working on policy issues going back all the way to 2005. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes, you know, you lead an organization or you work on court cases and, you know, you talk to the media and people think, you know, you've got this power at your hands and, you know, of course, you know, they almost may think it's easier to take a stand because you've got resources and you've got staff and you've got a platform. And, um, but I know what it's like to be that individual fighting for life, and religious freedom with really very little if no resources at my disposal. I know what it's like to sit in the, the chairs that you're sitting in, to be in your community when someone threatens your religious liberty rights or doesn't allow you to speak and the government is trying to oppress you. And you're wondering, what can I do? And you feel the will of the people in the community coming against you. And that is enormous pressure so I want to share with you all, when I was a student at the University of Houston Law Center, is really when I began getting involved in this type of work. So at the University of Houston Law Center, there was a pro-life group there called Pro-Life Cougars. And the University of Houston was being so restrictive to their free speech rights and had threatened people and intimidated them that they had dwindled down to one member. That member happened to somehow know of me or heard of me. I'm, I don't know 
you know, that I had quite the reputation that I do today, if you will. <laughs> uh, the legacy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I, but for some reason, she was aware of who I was. I was another student, but I had expressed to people an interest in pro-life work, and, and it had been something that I had cared about for quite a long time. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons I went to law school was to have an opportunity, maybe, someday, to be an advocate. Maybe just one case. Maybe I could work on one case. Maybe I could work on one piece of legislation and make a difference. Um, and, and so uh, a good friend of mine, Matt Staver of Liberty Council, wrote a book about these issues that we work on, and uh, he brought to my attention a Bible verse from Proverbs. And it says, he who presents his case first seems right until someone steps forth to challenge him. And those men like Matt Staver and Jay Sekulo that I used to listen to when I was driving in my truck around Austin as an undergrad and University of Houston inspired me because I knew we were going to need a next generation. Pioneers like Kelly Shackelford and Kathy Adams and Jay Sekulo um, and Matt Staver, these people that um, have been doing this for decades, we're going to need somebody to step forward. And so when this young lady contacted me, and asked me if I was pro-life and if I was a lawyer or a law student at the university, said, yes, and you know, I heard you were interested in these kind of issues, and I said, absolutely. I've heard that you know, there's been some concern about the group, and because I wasn't connected with them at that point, it was primarily an undergraduate group. And she said, yeah, I'm graduating. Will you take over the case and take over the group? And I said, well, um, okay, I'll certainly consider that. How many members of the group are there? And it's just me. Okay, so I'm going to become the president of the organization and, you know, lead this, this lawsuit and so on. Um, now, thankfully, we have lawyers working with us at Alliance Defending Freedom, so I didn't have to do the actual legal work as a, as a second-year law student, um, but I certainly had to be the face. And I had to wear it every single day. It was on the front page of the paper at the University of Houston, one of the largest university systems in the country. I had to hear about it in my First Amendment class. I had members of our Christian legal society that abandoned me, if you will. Refused to stand with us on that issue. If you've seen the movie God's Not Dead, maybe y'all seen that movie, in the credits there's a reference to that case. And you think about some of the things that happened. And I'm just sharing this with you because I want you to know, I know what it's like to be really someone of insignificance, but feel that tap on your shoulder and really just try to follow God's direction. So as a result of that, um, more people did find out who I was, and we stood firm. And the reasons that we had the pro-life group, and we stood for innocent human life, and we used that as a basis of our religious beliefs and free speech beliefs in order to do that, was because we cared about these issues and we knew it would impact somebody else. But I will tell you, there were moments where I felt like my legal career and my future were literally on the line. And I chose to risk it in the name of free speech and constitutional rights and life and religious freedom, and we won. That was before Kelly Shackelford knew who I was or I knew who he was, but a couple years later I would get an opportunity to, to work on these issues, and so I'm so proud to be here with you today. That was back in 2002 and 2003, and a lot of things have changed, unfortunately. Um, religious freedom is under attack like never before. There's no question, we see it all around us. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. There's a handout in your packet which has our Texas Values Action logo on the top. I want you to pull that out and just kind of walk along with me on this. You've heard some different examples and some different issues. Um, there's a piece of legislation by Senator Donna Campbell, who you're going to hear from later today, and it's Senate Joint Resolution 10. The reason it's SJR, Senate Joint Resolution, is because it's a constitutional amendment. Many of you on this room, or people before us, have worked on state laws to protect religious freedom. We passed a bill to protect Christmas last school uh, session, which our organization was a part of. We helped draft it and get it through the process. We've been involved, and many of y'all have too, I'm sure, with legislation to protect religious freedom in schools. 
It just doesn't seem like it's enough. The attacks continue to come. So this bill by Senator Campbell, which actually was filed the first time by our new Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick a few sessions back, would place in our Texas Constitution the religious freedom protection that every Texan deserves. It is modeled after the state law that we currently have and federal law on this same issue. How many of you all have heard of the Hobby Lobby case? One of the most significant religious freedom cases to ever come through the Supreme Court. And one of the most significant pro-life cases to come through because it protected the conscience rights of a business owner to make decisions about their business, their staff, their function based on their religious beliefs, their conscience, and not have the government force them to do something that violates those rights. Now, it's not an absolute. It doesn't mean that, that the constitutional language says that you always win if the government does something and you say, oh, well, my religion says that I don't have to do this. It's not, that's not how it works. It simply places in our Constitution the test that we have in statute and at the federal level. So when the government does come after you, you've got a fighting chance. I'm not so sure moving forward if what we have in statute is enough. And I'm gonna tell you why, because we have a law in place that over 19, uh, 18 other states have, and you'll see it here in our handout, it's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's the law that we have at the federal level, and that was the basis for the victory in Hobby Lobby. We want to use that same principle and those same legal standards and put it in our Constitution. Why? Because religious freedom is that important. And if we simply have a state statute in place, if laws are passed moving forward, that do not respect that statute, they could override them. And you might ask yourself, well, is that really happening? Yes. Well, let's look at our neighbors in New Mexico, okay? Um, the New Mexico case, and it's referenced on the back of this sheet, um, the Elaine Photography case. A small business owner, photographer, who was willing to photograph a same-sex couple for any other setting other than a wedding. Same-sex marriage was not even legal in New Mexico at the time. But this couple still wanted to use their own personal beliefs to trump the religious freedom rights of this small business owner. In New Mexico, they had state laws on religious freedom, but they also had a law in place like some of the ones we're seeing in Houston, San Antonio, and Plano that gave specific discrimination protection for issues related to homosexuality. So, when this photographer raised as a defense this law and her religious freedom rights, guess who won? Not religious freedom. They let this other law on homosexuality trump her religious freedom rights. If they had had a constitutional amendment on this language in place, that would have created a higher standard. But let's not even just look at New Mexico. Let's talk about what's happening in Texas. And I've got some examples for you here, okay? A case we worked on here in Austin, our team was a part of, one of the most significant cases recently for free speech and religious liberty for pro-life centers. The city of Austin passed an ordinance that would have forced Nonprofit pregnancy centers to post signs in front of their building that would have had the effect of discouraging women that were considering abortion from ever entering their center. Right. The government would have taken away the ability of those centers to do the job that they do best. The government would have been speaking first before that woman ever got to speak to someone in that center. They tried to do this in other parts of the country as well. The reason that these pregnancy centers exist is because their conscience and religious beliefs that compel them to reach out to women that are having issues and are having concerns and have needs and also because of their religious beliefs regarding innocent human life. Question that these centers do what they do because their faith calls them to do that. And 
It was their free speech beliefs and faith that were essentially on trial with this ordinance. So I remember I testified against it at the Austin City Council, and then um, our team got together with Liberty Institute, um, Liberty, and filed litigation along with some very notable people. Alliance Defending Freedom were part of it. There were a number of pro-life groups here in the Austin area that were a part of it. Uh, Texas Center for Defense of Life was a part of the litigation. We all got together and said, religious freedom and free speech rights of these pregnancy centers are essential. And uh, we won that case and protected the free speech and religious freedom rights of these pregnancy centers. So now they can do what they do best. But just like my case, right, you see the, the credits roll on God's Not Dead. Oh, pro-life cougars versus the University of Houston and, you know, Austin Pregnancy Centers versus the city of Austin. And you see these victories and you think, oh, yeah, great, we won. But you don't always hear the story that I told you about the University of Houston. The years that it took to get there, the doubt that creeps in, the money that is spent. That's right. We went to trial here in Austin in federal court on this issue for these pregnancy centers and waited for two years before we got a decision. If you run a pregnancy center, that's not what you should be worried about. Day after day after day thinking about that. Now thankfully, I feel like with the legal team we put together, they did feel confident that we were going to win. We had uh, former Texas Supreme Court Justice Raul Gonzalez was on our team. Um, one of the finest um, Catholic men and, and religious freedom and pro-life lawyers there are. Um, and a number of other all-stars that were part of what we were doing. So, but that's a long time. You see some of these other examples. I mean, these cheerleaders, right? The Coons cheerleaders. That litigation, I think pieces of it are still going on, okay? There's cases that go on for almost decades. We passed a Merry Christmas law during a time period where there's still a court case from a kid from Plano who just wanted to pass out pens to talk about the Christmas issue from the perspective of Jesus. That case is still going on, even though there's been a new law passed in the meantime. This valedictorian from Medina Valley, which is west of San Antonio, her name is Angela Hildebrand. Um, you're either going to be able to hear from her or her father during testimony for SJR 10 by Donna Campbell. Her father testified last time on this legislation because what he and his family and his daughter had to go through to get to victory was quite extraordinary but quite significant. And we can't always be certain that people are going to be that courageous. But I was a part of a team that represented Angela Hildebrand when she simply wanted to give her valedictory, valedictorian speech and talk about what compelled and what led to her being successful and being the top student. In Texas, that was an issue. So there were people in that community that challenged her on that issue and federal court got involved and a federal judge issued a decision and said that if she prayed or if she even said the word prayer, she would be incarcerated. That means she would go to jail for saying a prayer. Can you imagine being under that kind of pressure in the state of Texas, being a teenager? Would you follow through? I mean, do we have confidence? I mean, is that what we have to do in our state? We have to be able, every time this happens, to put everything we believe in, our academic career, our business. We've had clients who their businesses were on the line, their complete livelihood on the line just for religious freedom. That's where things have gotten to. Now, as you heard General Abbott talk about, that case was ultimately successful after lawyers appealed the decision and the Fifth Circuit stepped in. You heard Dave talk about what's happened with the, the Houston Five pastors. Yeah. And Ted Cruz showing up to the battle certainly helps. All right? And that, and I think he's going to have some representatives from his office here later. Um, I know that General Abbott at the time was very supportive, now Governor. I'm sure Ken Paxson would be on the same team. 
we've got great leaders that will step up. Um, and I remember I was at that press conference in Houston. You know, having been born and raised in Houston, one of the best moments of my life. But you know, I was also standing on the football field when Angela Hildebrand gave her valedictorian address. And there were police officers at the top of the football field with binoculars and with, with their weapons. Because there was so much media scrutiny and tension in that community that there was a real concern about the safety, not only of her as she stood right in the middle of that field, but the people in that audience. And I remember what that felt like when I was a student at the University of Houston. Those are real threats. Those are real concerns that most people typically will not follow through with and be able to handle because of the type of pressure that you're under when you're outspent and outmanned by the government. Um, so we look at these cases. I mean, you've got, I got another example here for you. Recently, it's not on the list, um, a group of, of Jewish folks in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that simply wanted to meet at their home. And um, you had government officials not allowing them to do it, wanting to enforce some type of absurd zoning regulations on these issues. These cases come up over and over again. Just before Passover, this group wanted to meet, and their ability to simply meet at a private home was being challenged. And you might think, is that what the other side really wants? That's exactly what they want. There was a conference held here earlier this session that the ACLU and Texas Freedom Network were a part of. And we happened to have a staff member that was in attendance at their meeting, and that's what they talked about. They said groups that have these type of meetings at their home should not be allowed, that that is not religious freedom, that that is actually what they need to fight against, you know, because they might have too many cars on the street. In their private home, that is what the ACLU and Texas Freedom Network and other of these groups are fighting. They want to take away your right at your private home to have a group of people meet. These are the threats that we're under. So you wonder about religious freedom and, you know, we when a lot of these cases, if you will, when they go to court, when you find lawyers that will come and battle these issues, when things come together and Ted Cruz or somebody shows up and there's enough media attention, but there are numerous cases that never make it to that point because there's not the funds, there's not the time, there's not the resources, and there's just not the will. That is not how the issue of religious freedom should go. So back to SJR 10, we recognize we may continue to win some of these battles, but boy, they are tough to fight. You know, and you have people like Paxton and Abbott and some of our great leaders, Ted Cruz. But while there's so much attention on this issue and so much legitimate concern about the threats to religious freedom, the time is now to do something lasting. When you put this type of religious freedom protection in the state constitution, that is a significant step forward in something that may actually create a legacy that we can count on for decades to come in our state. That's why we're pushing so hard for SJR 10, and there's a similar bill in the House, HJR 55. The language is, is a little bit different, but has similar goals. Um, with the type of people that have been elected in our state, we have the opportunity to do this, this session. We must do it this session. We know that Senator Patrick, excuse me, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, when he was a senator, filed this piece of legislation. So we have strong confidence. We've had this bill go through the legislative process before, and the reason that didn't pass last time was because people that were the chairs of these committees in the Senate refused to let it go forward. And the same in the House. The votes were there. This bill went to the floor in 2011, another version of it, and you had a confusion, you had a Democratic lawmaker who said that he was going to support the bill, but then go on the floor and, and say all kinds of things to suggest that there were problems with the bill and, and essentially undermine the whole effort. He's not in the legislature anymore. Yeah. 
Scott Hochberg does not have a vote on the Texas floor. And there shouldn't be any other member that should be allowing him to influence them how they vote on this issue, particularly if they say that they're Republicans or they're conservatives or they care about religious freedom no matter what political party they belong to. This issue is right for us to do something this session. And when you have Lieutenant Governor Patrick in the Senate, there is every expectation that we have the ability to do it. Um, this is where we are. When you have high school students being threatened with incarceration for not only praying at a graduation ceremony, but saying the word prayer, and you have pastors having their sermons subpoenaed by government officials, you know that we're not doing enough for religious freedom. And the time now is to say we've had enough and we're going to make a lasting change right here in 2015. I seem to be allowed to speak a little bit longer because some of the other speakers went uh, were, were better with their time. So I'm not going to keep you um, <laughs> all the way to lunch. Uh, but I've got a few other comments to share with you because this issue is not just about religious freedom. When we look at the issue of marriage, we see it related to religious freedom. When we look at the issue of life, we see it related to religious freedom. So many other issues that we work on are connected to this. Um, at the bottom of this handout, I've got a reference to Cecil Bell's bill, House Bill 623, and Kathy Adams did a fantastic job of talking about that. I want to mention a couple of updates related to it, because last week was quite busy on this marriage issue. Um, <laughs> redefining marriage equals a threat to religious freedom. There is no question. The reason the Houston Five had their pastor's sermons, their ser excuse me, those pastors had their uh, sermons subpoenaed was because they were talking about the issue of marriage and sexuality from the pulpit. Their religious freedom rights to talk about those issues were certainly threatened. Um, so in, in Travis County, you might think, well, you know, is it necessary for us to do more than just say we have these laws from one man and one woman, should we do more to actually enforce, you know, and are we being, you know, is this going overboard or is it really necessary? Well, we saw what happened in Travis County last week, okay? You first had a judge rule that the, the marriage law was unconstitutional, not uncommon for a Travis County judge. That's the only county that didn't vote for marriage out of 254 in 2005. But it went a step further later in the week because another case came up, I think on Wednesday, and the judge just ignored a law that requires the Attorney General's office to get involved. They're supposed to be notified when there's a threat to our constitutional provisions. That was a law that was passed a couple of sessions ago to prevent these kind of issues. And then the judge waived the 72-hour waiting period. I think by 930, this couple was, quote unquote, married in their eyes, which they're not. I mean, the, the, we know that that marriage is void. It's invalid. Why? Because we don't recognize marriage between people of the same sex, just like we don't recognize a marriage of three people together. Amen. It's void on its face, it's invalid. This is what they're willing to do. They're willing to go around these rules and not play by our laws, because apparently we haven't been strong enough about these issues and about how much we care about them and how we'll enforce them. And that, a case that's, that's really not talked about a lot is one in Houston. Oh, the mayor of Houston, here we are again, Anise Parker. Over a year ago, by executive order, said she was going to recognize marriage licenses of same-sex couples from other states and recognize their marriage for purposes of same-sex benefits. Myself and Jared Woodfield are part of a legal team. This is the first case that I know of in our state where we have sued an elected official, a government official, for recognizing same-sex marriage where that issue has been taken to court. So no one else would take the case. We got together and said it's time to do it. And we did it a year ago and we won. But just like a lot of these issues, that case is not over. It's been going on for almost a year and a half. It's expensive, it's time consuming. The case has been appealed. They, for, they forced the case to go up to federal court. Then we got it back to state court and got an injunction back in place. 
These elected officials, like the mayor of Houston, the county clerks here in Travis County, Bear County clerk who says he's a Republican, he says he's ready to issue same-sex marriage licenses, they do not respect the rule of law. So maybe if they have their salaries taken away from them, they will respect the law. Maybe if their power to issue marriage license is taken away from there and it's consolidated in an elected official that will uphold the rule of law, that will get their attention. That is where we are. On the back of this, I just want to point you to some talking points that you're going to talk with elected officials that we feel like will help you have better dialogue. Because the other side will like to talk about the issue of equality. Isn't this about equality? So what we say is, let's talk about what redefining marriage equals. Right? We've heard that today. Redefining marriage equals private businesses being forced to fund their, um, participate in their business and, or shut down and violate their religious conscience rights. Um, redefining marriage and sexuality equals men going to little girls' bathrooms. Redefining marriage equals taxpayers being forced to fund same-sex benefits. And redefining marriage equals pastors being persecuted. That's what redefining marriage equals. And we've got some other examples here, too. The one that I like, though, that I, um, I think I ran out of a little bit of space in here, but you can read these yourself. The other side we'll talk about, you want to be on the right side of history. Well, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals did a really good job of talking to us about the history of marriages between one man and one woman. The history of marriage between one man and one woman is so long that it's not measured in years or decades. It's measured in millennia. That's the side of history I want to be on. So some good talking points there on this issue um, related to this, and you can see how these issues of religious freedom and holding government officials accountable are intertwined. Um, there's, a, there's a handout here. You'll see these bill numbers in more detail that looks like this. It's got the Faith and Family Day logo. And um, you'll see Senator Campbell's bill, you'll see Senator Bell's bill. Senator Charles Perry has also filed a bill on this issue related to holding elected officials accountable on the marriage issue and uh, consolidating the, um, the marriage license issue. And there's also a few more that you can take a look at too that we invite you to, to walk and talk with your elected officials about to co-author um, with uh, Representative Rick Miller, who you heard earlier, talking about these issues related to the state having control over what happens at the state level and not letting local governments uh, run over our powers and um, other issues related to sex education and a divorce um, waiting period. I um, also want to, uh, we're, I'm going to close just a second here too, we'll give you some instructions about what happens before the, uh, our celebration later. The Preservation Board doesn't want us to call it a rally, just so you know because they don't want things to get too crazy in here. And, and I think y'all probably all heard, we're not going to the South Steps later because of the weather and, and so on. We're going to stay in here. And so, um, but, um, so we'll have some fun. We'll have a celebration. What we're going to do later, too, is we're going to bring up a cake because we have an important anniversary to celebrate today. Um, it's not quite to the day, but it's close. This year, we're celebrating 10 years of our marriage laws in the Constitution being between one man and one woman. So, we've got, a, we've got a cake that we're gonna have and we're gonna encourage elected officials to take a picture with us with that cake. Um, but uh, I invite you to go through these, these bill numbers and don't feel like you've gotta go to a, a big discussion. Tell them the bill number, we've got a short um, description of it and the name of it and tell them you're asking them to co-author the bill. And these are some of our leaders you'll see on these issues uh, that care about them um, and, and know what's, what's important to, to folks in the state of Texas. Um, and and I, I can't conclude my thoughts without um, mentioning to y'all that uh, the marriage case is before the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay? And it, uh, it is going to impact religious freedom, all these issues. 
And some people will say some of these issues are probably going to get resolved. You know, Dave Welch's group and all the people like our Texas Values Action that are helping with these ordinances in Houston and places, oh, all that will get worked out, you know, and they'll let the courts deal with it. As a way to say they don't want to deal with it during this legislative session. You know, let's see what happens after the court case. Why should we wait until then? Why should we wait until it's too late? And then we got to come back a year and a half later. Who would imagine this list that I gave you really has happened in the past year and a half of these religious freedom violations? How many more are going to be on that list if we wait another year and a half? Am I going to have enough room on the paper to list them all? If you could have imagined, we'd be here. So challenge them to do what they're supposed to do right now during this session. This is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to address these immediate concerns that they're facing right now. And these issues, as you've seen and heard today, are happening right now. Um, I just real quick want to um, point out a few uh, folks that you haven't heard from speak. If you need some help after we finish up uh, at noon and you go visit offices, um, the groups that have been participating have done a fantastic job. My staff is on site here and our office is close by, so they have worked extremely hard too. Um, if they could just stand up for a quick second, David Walls, and that could be helpful after me. Nicole Hudgens is somewhere in the room, or she's probably outside. Uh, LaDawn Wilson and Becky Conley. So, um, had everybody in our office yesterday putting things together, and they were here late, early this morning. We've been working for a couple weeks to get all these things together. So, I'm thankful we have um, great staff to do that. Um, so, what we're going to do is um, we're going to take a little break here in a minute, and we're going to start back at noon. But I want to give you some specific instructions. We have lunch that's available for folks that have ordered it after the um, 12 to 1 celebration. And so um, if you want to get something between now and then, um, unless Ann's going to keep you up here a little bit longer, don't go far. We want to start promptly at noon, which really means we want you to be back here at 1145. We want the, you know, don't leave it all if you don't have to, okay? We want this crowd here. We want the elected officials when they come in to see so many people here that care about the issue. Um, there will be plenty of time later in today for us to visit offices. We don't want you to start doing that just yet. Um, take the time to, to talk with the people that you spoke to get more instructions on what to do and how to address these issues. Um, also, one of the other things that we're going to do is we're going to reassemble this um, space that has our information about Faith and Family Day and all that. You'll see all that up here. But we're going to bring the cake in here. So if you want to take a picture of this cake that we've designed celebrating 10 years of our marriage law, we encourage you to do that. When we finish with our celebration later, we're going to encourage all the elected officials to come up here and take a picture with our anniversary cake. Um, because we should be celebrating marriage. There is no question. Um, we should be proud that we live in a state where we know we know the impact that divorce has on marriage. We know the impact that redefining marriage has on marriage. We know, as studies continue to show, year after year, the model that works best, particularly for children, is when mom and dad are gathered together in a household raising that child and children. That is the gold standard, and it continues to still exist today. So we will be celebrating that law and celebrating marriage uh, later today. And so, um, did you have any other announcements you wanted me to make? And um, so, uh, that's going to be exciting. So, we've got a great group of people later today. Lieutenant Governor Patrick is going to be towards the end, but we're going to start off with Cecil Bell Jr., who was the one that fired the first shot across the bow on the marriage issue and filed legislation, House Bill 623, to start holding these elected officials accountable that are going rogue on these issues. Um, going to have Connie Burton is going to speak, one of our newest senators, a number of, uh, Senator Donna Campbell, a number of great people. So please, if you feel compelled to leave or grab a quick snack, please come back. Be back in here by 1145 so we can get started promptly. If there's any information that you haven't given, um, please get that in the meantime. And I'll leave you with one, one uh, final comment. A phrase that we hear a lot at the Capitol is government belongs to those who show up. You are here today and you have shown up. 
You represent not just the hundreds of people in this room, but thousands if millions of people across this state that you can speak on behalf of that could not make it here today. Do not for a second take for granted the opportunity you have today and the impact that you can have. I heard a legislator tell me one time that if he got seven calls in his office in a week, that that was a lot. Okay. Now, when, when Houston got there, when that ordinance came out, we got about 110,000 emails to the city of Houston. We know these, this group, the people in this room, we know that y'all multiply quite quickly when it comes to the issues you care about and getting the word out. So, um, so stick around. If you need to get a snack, go ahead and do that. Be back here at 1145. Be ready to be inspired and encouraged after you hear these people speak and be ready to go do what Texans do today. Thank you very much.